great theme, this theme, and I am so excited about it. Um, Paul and I have been talking about this for a while, and we're topping and tailing this today. I'm speaking first, and Paul's going to speak uh, fourth. And when we've been talking about it, we've been talking in the context of really some of the things that we might be able to achieve. I've just been asked if I'll do a further term as one of the presidents of Churches Together in England, the Free Churches moderator. That's never happened before. But I want to maximize that opportunity. It means that I'll be in post in that role until 22, 2022. But then I'm saying, well, you know, how can we spread out beyond that? Because one of the things I do have is a real passion for the church, the church in this country in all its diversity, but also the church globally. And I'm just so convinced that what we need to see is the whole of the church making an impact on the whole of society. I am weary of being told how exciting it is with this little group and how exciting it is with that little group and how united these people are over here. And when I talk to them, I discover the reason they're united is because they've dissociated from so many other people in the church and say we're united around our little core beliefs and our core convictions. And as far as we're concerned, the rest we just write off. When the church talks like that, society writes the church off. It's the way they see us. They don't appreciate us being the little clique that's going to do it. They say, well, what about the rest of you? You know, where, where are you in this? So there's a passion in my heart to see the whole church move forward. Now, some parts of it might be easier to motivate than others, but we've got to start somewhere. But we've got to also have that conviction in our hearts. And I'm starting with this because I'm being upfront with you about it, that I want to see this happen. And I've seen changes in areas of the church in my lifetime that I never thought would change. If you've ever read what happened with Vatican II, the Catholic Church Council, some of you would be amazed. Some of you are living as if that never happened. And yet some of us were praying for a long time that God would do something. One of the things that we're so bad at is we don't celebrate what God has done if it's not particularly in our little patch. If it happens to us, we're excited, but if it happens to everyone else, we just don't notice, really. But God is at work, and he's doing amazing things. I don't know whether you know this, but everyone talks as if the church in this country is in decline. Yes, it is in, in rural areas, but we're seeing urban growth. I'm doing some work with the church growth unit up in Durham, and just about in all of the major cities, we're beginning to see church growth. It's a turnaround. And it's happening in places you wouldn't expect. Yes, it is happening amongst the Pentecostal churches. But it's also happening amongst the Evangelical Anglicans. It's happening in our cathedrals. Cathedral congregations are up way beyond that which anyone would have expected. And so, you know, just write off your preconceptions and realize that God is up to something. And when we get concerned about the, the decline in some of our, our denominations, a lot of that is because people have got rural churches and it's really hard to maintain rural church when it's easy to get into the car with your teenage children and drive to a dynamic church down the road. We've got to rethink how we engage with our rural communities. I've been excited by what the Anglican Church is doing, for example. It's looking at having resource center churches that can actually then service out into those rural communities. What we've done in the past is to try and take all the churches in the rural communities, lump them together and say, make the best of it amongst yourselves. But you know, I, someone said to me a long time ago, you know, if you've got a dead horse, the way to make it recover is not to strap it to another one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, you need to actually have some life in the situation somewhere. So we're really looking at it today about how we can put life and celebrate the life that God has put into the church and really make it happen. So when we came up with the title for today that we wanted to just see the church move, we thought we'd keep it really simple. We'd just say, move. And I didn't know where to start on this. I, I know where I'm going. And I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I preach exegetically, so you're going to find I'm going to go through scriptures and everything else. But I came across something. You might not have ever read this. But years ago, someone wrote a parody of Onward Christian Soldiers. And I guess it summed up the way they felt about the church at the time. I'm going to read it to you. Some of you might not even know the words to one with Christian soldiers, so, so bear with me if you don't, and you can look it up on the internet because they are there, I can tell you. But this is the version that someone came up with. It's a parody looking at the way they saw the church at the time. Backward Christian soldiers fleeing from the fight. 
with the cross of Jesus nearly out of sight. Christ, our rightful master, stands against the foe, but forward into battle we are loath to go. And the refrain, backward Christian soldiers fleeing from the fight with the cross of Jesus nearly out of sight. Now, you might react against that negatively, but I'm saying that as a provocation to you. That if that's the way that someone has seen the church in the past, we must make sure that's not the way anyone sees the church in the future. Let me read on. Like a mighty tortoise moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where we've always trod. We are much divided, many bodies we, having many doctrines, not much charity. Crowns and thorns may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus hidden does remain. Gates of hell should never against the church prevail. We have Christ's own promise, but think that it will fail. So here then, ye people, join our useless throng, blend with ours your voices in a feeble song. Blessings, ease and comfort us from Christ the King. With our modern thinking, we don't need to do a thing. And some of you are thinking, I know a church like that, just down the road from where I live. <laughs> but that's not what you're meant to be thinking. You're meant to be thinking, it's time to rise up. I don't think that the church is dead. But you know, even if it was, I believe in resurrection life. <laughs> I really do. And when we were singing, death could not hold him down, I think, wow, death can't hold anything down that's got the life of God in it. And so I'm excited. I think that we can see something happen in this nation. And you might have given up on the church. I, mean, now I was asked recently, because in one particular situation, one country I go to quite a lot, they were doing a, a, a national schools campaign, and they were really struggling to get the churches involved. And it looked for a moment as if they were going to have a, a, a need to put the program on hold. And I said, don't put the program on hold. Just do it in the schools. And if need be, get the kids in the schools to set up the groups that can do the follow-up. Because we can't lose the momentum. But that wasn't me saying, I think the church is over. It was me saying, I think the church needs to get its act together. But you know, if God's saving people, and the result of that campaign on that island was that thousands of young people made commitments to Christ. Amen. And you know, when the life of God is inside you, you know, sometimes we talk as if follow-up is about making sure that they actually really, really, really did make the commitment that they claim to believe. Whereas actually it's about fostering the life that God has placed within them. It's watering a seed that's growing. It's not trying to make something grow that's not there. And I know with some people come to me and say, we've got a great discipleship program in our church. Actually, before you need a discipleship program, you need a life-giving program. Because discipling dead sheep is not going to get them very far. And we just need to get that momentum back in the church. And I just want you to get the sense that this is how the church was birthed. It was birthed to be a church on the move. That's the way that God designed it. I looked at all the various options in, in the New Testament and there was, there was no one that I couldn't have gone to and said, that's a great church, let's look at that. Because every single church had got momentum. And when we look at the church in Corinth, we say, oh, that church had problems. But you know, it had got more life than you can possibly imagine. And it was just so powerful. I would have loved to have been part of that church in Corinth. And what a church it would have been. You know, when you look at the kind of people in the church, it says, and some of you were this, and some of you were that, and some of you were something else, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. And it's great. God can take the things that are not and actually raise up a church that can bring the things that think they are down to nothing. And that's a great place to be, because when you think you're nothing, God can raise you up again. That's where we all have to get to at some point in life, isn't it? Where we know it's not about me, it's not about my energy, it's not about my momentum, it's about what God puts into my heart and into my life. So I want the church to move. And I'm going to keep this really simple. I want the church to move upward, I want the church to move outwards, and I want the church to move onwards. Basically anywhere but backwards. All right? So I don't want backwards Christian soldiers. I want upwards, outwards, onwards, you know, whatever. Downwards if you've got to reach to the people that are lost. You know, don't just be so arrogant and say, you know, I'm only interested in reaching the up and outs. God's interested in the down and outs. He's interested in the up and outs as well. But let's have that mindset. We've got to move everywhere but backwards. That's where we've got to go. And as I look at this with you and look at upwards and outwards and onwards, 
I want to just take the Thessalonian church. I, I, I could have gone anywhere, as I say, but I felt to go, and I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians. Because I think this is where we're at. This is, this is not me trying to raise the dead, really, but it's me saying that there is life and let's make it happen. And it says this, and I'm going to read from uh, verse 2 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And it says this, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labour of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election of God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Waiting for his son from heaven. But not like waiting at a bus stop. You know, just standing there thinking one day the bus might come. It's actually having that passionate kind of waiting. The scripture says occupy until he comes. It doesn't say vegetate until he comes. We are waiting for the Lord to come. But we want to see so much more before he comes. We want him to come for a church that's without spot and wrinkle. We want him to come for a church that's actually reached out so that the gospel's being heard in every part of the earth. And when you think the commission's being fulfilled, you have to do it again for the next generation as well. And so there should be that kind of momentum in the church. But I want to begin with that sense of the church moving upwards. The church needs to find a level of spiritual authority going forward that is lacking in so many places at the moment. The church has lost its confidence. And I don't know what's happening to the church. I, I sometimes sit in situations and think, have we become a bunch of wimps? You know, because I hear so many people saying things like, you know, we can't really survive if this country isn't as Christian as it used to be. I mean, come on, folks. If you look at the church in the New Testament, every environment that it was in was contrary to it. And yet we talk as if, you know, we're going to collapse if this doesn't sort of change this way, change that way. We're here to be the change agents, Amen. not to be the ones that are just protesting about it. We're here to be salt and light in the earth. And please, you know, when you talk about being salt, it doesn't mean that your whole meal has to taste of salt. It means that there needs to be salt that affects everything. And the church, when it thinks about being light at the moment, seems to have got a fixation with being the searchlight. What can we find that's wrong in society? And we're focused on this and we're focused on that. That is not the answer. It's not the mission. It's not what we're meant to do. It's the light that gives light to the whole house. We shouldn't be just shining spotlights into dark corners. We should actually be illuminating the whole of society so that people can move around freely and get the benefit of it. You know, if I'm coming against something that I think is not right, I'm not doing it because it offends my Christian principles. I'm doing it because I believe that society would be better if it embraced certain understandings. I want to see society healthy. I want to see people's lives healthy. I want to see righteousness exalting the nation. I really do. But how is the nation going to become righteous if all we're doing is picking holes in it all the time when what we should be doing is saying, here's the example. I remember years ago being in certain parts of um, East Africa where the AIDS epidemic was raging. And people were saying to me, what should we do? And you know, one of the challenges was, I said, oh, you know, it's not for me to speak out. Your church leaders are speaking out. But it's very hard if the church is not providing the example that you can point to. See, I'm amazed at the love of Jesus when he looks at his church. I know I say this often, and I've probably said it on this platform before. But you know, Jesus said of the church, you are the light of the world. <laughs> and then, you know... A few years on, 
You look at the church at Thyatira, it's got problems. You look at the church at Ephesus, it's got problems. And honestly, when you look at the seven churches that are recorded in the book of Revelation, out of those seven, to be honest, they've all got problems, but some have got such severe problems that it looks as if the light's almost about to go out. So what does Jesus do? You've read Revelation. When he speaks, you turn to see the voice that spoke. But you know what you see first? You see the seven lampstands. You see the seven lampstands. And five of the lights on the lampstand are flickering. They're about to go out. And yet Jesus stands in the midst of the lampstands as if he's proud of his church. He doesn't want to identify anywhere else. He doesn't say, oh, take this to the Photoshop and see if we can get, you know, make them look brighter or something. You'd be amazed. Those of you who are not looking too happy today, we can change that on video. We can make you smile. Even when you don't think you are, we can do it for you now. We could probably put a few more people in the empty seats. So all of those of you who are hiding behind the pillars, you know, you don't have to move there. We can actually, as it were, transplant you out of your seat and put you over there. That's Photoshop, but Jesus didn't do Photoshop. He didn't say, I want to see these lights burning brightly. He said, I will identify with my church, come what may, and I will speak into my church. And why do we think that the churches, five, never responded? Hey, come on. Jesus gave them a word that was so specific. He said, this is what you're getting right. This is what you're getting wrong. This is what you've got to do about it. And this is the reward when you've got it right. What makes us think that they didn't respond? What makes us think that they didn't become overcoming churches? I know some of them have disappeared now, but that's 2,000 years later. There's a lot of history gone on in that area. But you know, if you got a letter from Jesus, you wouldn't just put it behind the clock, would you, and say, oh, well, one day I might read that. Not that anyone puts letters behind the clock now, but, you know, that's an old illustration from my youth. <laughs> but you, you wouldn't sort of put it in the... If you got an email from Jesus, you wouldn't put it in the red box without reading it, would you? Not that anyone ever does that. You know, do, you, do you mark them as red when you haven't... Anyway, but... Um, <laughs> You'd read it, wouldn't you? You'd say, I want to know what Jesus thinks of his church. And I want to respond to that. Because he speaks in love. And he says, you can overcome. And when you overcome, this is what you'll get. And it's a great reward. So we've got to move upward. We've got to move into a new level of confidence. We've got to realize that Jesus has not given up on his church. And we needn't give up on the church either. He's got plans He's got expectations. He's coming back for a glorious church. And he will come back. Because somehow he will get this church glorious. Whatever he has to write to us, whatever he has to say to us, whatever prophets he has to send to provoke us, he will get us where he wants us to be. And that's amazing. You know, Andy, he's interested in getting rid of our spots. So, you know. That means he's got young people in the church with spots. I remember being in the church with spots. And when your spots go, guess what comes? Wrinkles. Well, you know. <laughs> God's coming for a church without spots and wrinkles. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> he'll make the young look mature and he'll make the mature look young. This is going to be stunning. I'm looking forward to it. But you know, that's the transformative power of God. And he wants to raise the confidence level in the church. I want you to be confident in your calling. I want you to be confident that as individuals. And some of you can say, I don't know if I've got a calling. Did you hear Jesus say, come? And did you respond? Yes. So you've had a calling. That's enough of a calling. And, and do remember, he always says, come before he says, go. Have you noticed that as well? He doesn't say, go. He says, Come. He called his disciples to himself before he sent them out. And he's calling us to himself so that we can have that confidence boost. He wants to lift us up. He wants to say, actually, if you think this is all about looking up to me, in some ways it's about being seated with me and looking down on the problems. That's where he wants us to be, on that higher ground of confidence. And that's where we've got to get to, individually corporately, just aware that there's a calling. I deal with 24 denominations in the free churches group. 
Every single one of those has got an amazing history. Most of them have forgotten what it is. But if they found it again and got excited by it, they'd probably find what the marketing people would call a USP, their unique selling point. And if they found that, what a contribution that would make. Some say, why have we got so many denominations? Because God is so incredibly creative. And there are so many different things that need to be emphasized. And there are times when someone's got to stand up and emphasize this and someone else has got to stand up and emphasize that. But it's that coming together with all those different emphases that are somehow going to get the truth across to our hearts. So don't be afraid of diversity. And don't think it's I, only I am left. Do you know the way that Elijah spoke? And God reminded him how many thousands of others hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. We can be in a negative mindset and God says, upwards, <laughs> out of your negative mindset, come up to where I am, get confidence in your calling, know that I value you and I really believe in you. I know that the church in Thessalonica faced challenges, but look at the beginning it had. When the word was preached to them, it was preached in power. If you go to Acts 17, you can see just where Paul preached. He reasoned with them. He showed them. He explained. They got hold of the gospel. They knew from day one how to give a reason for the hope that was in them because they'd had the gospel so well presented to them. We need churches like that where we're not only confident in our calling, but we're confident in the content that we have in the gospel. We're confident in the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. The church has got to come up. We've got to go up to that level that he wants us to be. God wants to stir our hearts and bring that transformation into our lives. You know, I just want to read a little bit from Acts 17, just so that you get the impetus again of what's written here. It says in verse 1, Now when they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preached to you in Christ is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, because Coming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob. <laughs> you know, the trouble began on day one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's knowing that kind of pressure that sometimes makes you realize what you're up against. But at the same time, it should make you know what you've got on the inside of you. You know, those, those, that, that opposing bunch was so evangelistic in their antagonism that when they went and preached the gospel in Berea, the antagonists followed them up to have a go in Berea as well. But you know, one of the things that happens is this, that the church begins to discover each other. And the church in Thessalonica came to discover the church in Berea. And you begin to see through the New Testament that it doesn't matter the diversity of the church, there was this willingness to reach out and embrace each other. And when, and when the Gentiles started coming into the churches, it was difficult because that's not what they were expecting. But you know, they had to embrace the Gentile church, which in many ways was radically different from the Jewish church. It could cope. It didn't see diversity as a hindrance. It saw that reaching outward and embracing one another was a way of increasing our impact on the world. We've got a society that struggles to get on with each other. People don't want people from this nation. They don't want people from that nation. But the church is made up of people from every nation. And he's called us out of every kindred, tribe and nation. Which means that you don't have to keep banging on about where you came from and what you believed and what it was like there because we've been called out of it. I know it's hard to really get your head around that. But, uh, but I, I remember a story years ago. Uh, it was the start of a meeting and someone went up to someone they'd never seen before in the meeting and he said, great to see you, where are we from? And he said, I'm a Yorkshireman, I'm proud of it. <laughs> and the person said, well, God will set you free of that before the end of the meeting. <laughs> but you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's that holding on to where we've been, what we've done, our unique way of doing things that stops us embracing other people. And what we've got is good, it's God-given. 
But it's not all that God has got. We've all got to acknowledge that. It's together with all the saints that we know what is the height, the length, the breadth, the depth of the love of God. We've got to see it. And actually, you grow in love the more challenging the person is that you're loving. Now, don't look at your spouse and, and quote that out then. <laughs> but in church life, it's true. If you only love the people that you like, you're not going to grow. It's somehow that God has shed love abroad in our hearts that, that goes beyond all of that. This isn't filio love that we've got, which is just brotherly affection. It's agape love. It's the love that comes from God's heart, which can cross those kind of boundaries and enable us to embrace. So when we move, you know there's a sense in which we move up, but we've also got to move out. We've got to be much more inclusive in our understanding. We've got to appreciate people. You know, one of the things that really made life difficult when I was first a youth leader, when I was 18 in an Anglican church, you know, it was during the riots on, on Brighton Seafront with the mods and the rockers, you know, the people on the scooters and the people on the motorbikes, the leather jackets versus the parkers and all of those kind of things. And it was a nightmare. And it was also when the football hooliganism was just starting. So I, I used to have a riot in the youth club on a Saturday night. And, you know, it was like refereeing a riot. And, and the church members didn't really appreciate this, you know. They said, these people have got to behave. Well... <laughs> It was hard work getting them to behave, to be honest. But, you know, that was the rule in those days. You had to behave in order to believe. And then they really wanted to make sure you believed before you were allowed to belong. I mean, goodness knows how many classes you had to go through in order to prove that you believed before they'd allow you to belong. It was like the bar for membership was set way, way up here. And when we started seeing the rough sleepers on Brighton Beach come to the Lord, all those people they used to call beatniks in those days, we saw amazing moves of God. And it was just incredible. But the church was sort of, ooh, you know. But embrace. The arms of Jesus on the cross were stretched wide enough to take in the whole world. Some of us have got to do a bit of stretching and realize that that is the inclusive heart of God. I'm so glad that churches now are shifting it around from <laughs> behave, believe, belong to sort of, well, why don't you just come and be part? I, I know you're not there yet, but they, they, they know that too. You'd be amazed. They do realize there's enough power in the gospel to convince people that have come to an inclusive church that they need to know more than just a, that if they were joining any other kind of club. They get it. They know it. There's a power of conviction that comes when people sit there thinking, oh, I belong, but do I really? Have I really got where these people have got? Have I got what they've got? All of that convicting power comes in the context of church life. If you don't believe me, read again what Paul writes to the Corinthian church when he's talking about when those who come in from outside. What happens? They can be convicted by what is happening in your midst. And they can repent and they can respond to the gospel. This happens, and we've got to be excited about it and confident in it. Wow. Belonging in order to believe, and believing in order to become. It's the opposite way round. We should have spotted it. If we'd read our Bibles properly, we would have seen it from day one. And we'd have had a very, very different kind of church. I was working with a church down in Wales the other day, and they're going to adopt a 50-50 agenda. They're looking to get to the point where every time they meet, they want 50% of the people there that haven't yet made a commitment to the Lord. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's a huge challenge, you know. For most of us, it's like 200 to 1. <laughs> and we're not even sure about the 1, you know. <laughs> Perhaps not this week. Yeah, you know the way it goes. But I think there's a challenge that's going out in the Spirit. Come on, guys. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit that will enable us, actually, not just to reach upwards, which probably you feel very comfortable about. That's what the Holy Spirit's come to do, isn't it? To elevate us to a higher plane so that we can have fellowship with the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, of course we know all of that. But he hasn't just come to lift us up. He's come to push us out, outwards. Say, come on, embrace one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, in that you have love for one another. Let the world see it. And stop this, this, this sort of selective bit. Well, I love this little bit, and I love that little bit, but yeah, be honest, you know. 
No, come on, let the world see. Let the world see we're not all divided. <laughs> that we're actually full of the love and charity of God. But I want us to go onwards as well. And when I look at the church at Thessalonica, and this is one of the reasons why I came to this church, although I could have come to any of them, it was a church that faced obstacles. It was a church that faced obstacles. It was a church that had every right to say, it's tough out there, let's, let's just entrench. Let's just, you know, let's just lock down for a while. It was tough when we began and they started persecuting us from day one. And it's tough now because they're still doing it. What shall we do? And Paul writes them and says, now come on, that's not the way you've got to be. Let me just give you two other verses from 1 Thessalonians that really make the kind of points that I want to bring across. <laughs> the first one really is about the inclusiveness of God's heart. And he talks about the way that we can reach out and embrace other people. <clears throat> it says, for you brethren, this is verse 14 of chapter 2, for you brethren became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same thing from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans. Can you see that although this was largely a Gentile church, it was prepared to learn lessons from the church that was in Jerusalem. We need to learn from one another. This is reaching out. And the church in Jerusalem was amazing at reaching out. And it wasn't always easy for them. <laughs> they didn't quite know what to do if, with Cornelius' household. They didn't quite know what to do when people in Antioch that weren't Jews started getting saved. But somehow God enabled them to reach out. And James understood that scripture about the, the tabernacle of David being raised up as being a way in which the Gentiles should come in. Yeah, I know it was about inclusive worship, but it was also about inclusive church. Bringing people in. You know, it was great that they had so many amazing musicians in David's tent. But David's tent was never meant to be something that was just for the Jews. You know, he was trying to say a house of prayer for all nations. Because that's God's heart. So we reach out and learn from one another. But you know, when it talks about overcoming, there's so much that you can read in the first letter to the Thessalonians. It says this in verse 3 of chapter 3. No one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Wow! It's our appointment. Do you think that's God being hard on you? Do you think it's him saying, Do you, know, I'm, you know, now you're saved, I'm really going to put you through it. Do you think that's what he's saying? I'll tell you actually what he's saying. He's saying, now you're saved. You can start being my agents of transformation. I actually believe the accuser of the brethren is cast down. I don't believe that he's still accusing us in the heavenly places. But I do believe that we've got an assignment now to bruise him under our feet. He hasn't been sent down to punish us. He's been sent down that we might punish him. Yes. If you got that, if you understood that, that this is what we're meant to be doing. When it said, the, the seed of woman shall bruise the serpent's head, of course it referred to Jesus. But the mission of the church is to be Jesus in the world, isn't it? So we carry on with that same sense. We get the victory. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I don't know what's happened to the church. Some Bible scholar said to me, I like the Colossian letter. It's so much superior to the Ephesian letter because it doesn't mention spiritual warfare. I thought, hey, come on, what are you saying? <laughs> that spiritual warfare is what the church talks about in its infancy. And then we grow out of it. Well, that is part of the problem. The church has grown out of spiritual warfare. It's sort of not in fashion, is it? Oh. I, there was one place I was in the country, I won't say which, and I said, can you tell me what the biggest obstacle to gospel, gospel proclamation, I get it a minute, the biggest obstacle to gospel proclamation is in your city? They said, we know exactly what it is. So I said, what are you doing about it? I said, absolutely nothing. The last person who tried died. <laughs> so I thought, come on. If that's, if that's what you're scared of, let's be a bit bolder. 
and say, well, if that's all it takes, you know, to lay your life down for the gospel, we wouldn't be the first person to do it, would we? And what a transformation that could bring. But we get scared. The church doesn't want to talk about the devil, doesn't want to talk about sin, doesn't want to talk about a lot of things. But I'm not talking about talking about. I'm talking about doing something about it. Actually being out there to make a difference. And every obstacle that comes our way, everything that makes it hard to preach the gospel, every church split, every problem that we get that makes us feel, oh, back off, back off, is really an opportunity for us to say, okay, we're under attack, but come on, we're going to move forward. We're going to move forward. And sometimes when you're under attack, don't be so self-righteous and say it's persecution. Sometimes it's your own fault as well. <laughs> sometimes it is. Sometimes things go wrong because we've messed up. But just because we messed up, it doesn't mean we should give up. We should get up <laughs> and get going and have that mentality which says we've got to press onwards. I want the church to move forwards. As much as I want it to move upwards and to move outwards, it's upwards and outwards in order to move onwards, to make a difference out there. So I know I'm asking you to move in three directions at once, but I believe it's possible. I'm not saying put off the onwards until we've done at least a year of upwards and outwards. Or six months. Or in some churches it looks like, you know, 60 years before we do. No, it's all at the same time. Church, move up. Because when you do, you'll discover you've got a new confidence in God. A new confidence in your calling. You know, your church might have not have been going long. But it's very easy in a few years to forget what was the passion that brought it into being. Rediscover the passion. Rediscover the passion. It might be what you need to drive yourself forward again. But regardless of where your church is at, where are you at? Are you feeling, again, that energizing of the Spirit? That when Jesus said to me, come, <laughs> he had need of me. And don't get all puffed up, you know. Oh, I'm so glad that God has need of me. The only time it actually says that in Scripture is referring to a donkey. So, <laughs> the Lord has need of you. So, you know, just take heart from that. <laughs> It's not a cause for arrogance, but God does need you. That's why he called you. And some of you are saying, well, can he use me? Yes, he can use you. No matter how odd, unique, or whatever you might think yourself to be, that uniqueness is something that God wants in his kingdom. And there's somewhere he could place you where you would have such an impact. You might even be in that place right now. Because sometimes we're praying that God will send us and he's already put us. We just don't go like people who are sent. And you know what the difference? If you're sent, you, you, there's something that gives you a confidence in that place. And even if they don't send you from the church, know that you're sent from God. And get out there with that confidence. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And all of his authority came from those three words. Sent from God. And that's what we've got to find. So upwards, outwards, be embracing. But onwards, onwards. See everything that is an obstacle as an opportunity. As an opportunity. It'll be an opportunity for you to grow. But don't worry too much about that. It's an opportunity for you to advance the cause of Christ. <laughs> and your growth will be coincidental. You know, you're not going to grow just by looking at yourself. I know I've shared this before, but I remember when they had the very first advertisement on television. This is really making me sound old. They, it, they, BBC had no advertisements. These days, they just advertise BBC. If you notice that, there are more advertisements on BBC about BBC programs. That, you, know, you can't, uh, never mind. But anyway, when they started independent television, they had advertisements. And the very first advertisement was from post office savings. And there were two little boys who went down the bottom of their garden. They each planted a seed. Hmm? and one of them went down the bottom of his garden every day with a watering can and the other one went down every day with a trowel one of them just watered it and let it grow the other one dug it up every day to see how it was getting on <laughs> now it was meant to be a lesson about how you do savings 
But it's a fantastic lesson about how you're meant to live the Christian life. Stop digging yourself up every day to see how you're getting on. And just get on. <laughs> get on and make the difference. And God will cause you to grow. So that's the mandate. Well, that's a bit of the mandate. I could have explained it so many other ways, but it's enough to get you going. We've got other speakers here who can get you going a bit further, but I just wanted to put that out there as the mandate. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to get uh, Paul back up again, and you're going to get an opportunity to put what I've been talking about into practice a little bit. So I hope you've taken some notes. You're going to have opportunity to ask questions of everyone who speaks at the end of the day, but you're going to do a little bit of work yourself in between sessions. So let me just pray, and then I'll hand back to Paul. Father, I just want to thank you for the privilege of being able to uh, set this whole process in motion today whereby we are going to get an understanding of how you see your church and how you want us to move. So I just pray, Lord, that the things that we've spoken about in this session, that you'll plant them in our hearts and expand them as we go through the day and that your Holy Spirit will be working in each one of us to empower us and encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you.